morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. And we've already prayed, and I hope that people begin to pray before they go through these messages. Um, we're going to continue on. Now, last Sabbath, we already went through the verses for uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. Okay, so I'm not going to do that again. It's in your handout. Okay, this is literally the timeline of the fourth church period of Thyatira. And in that process there, we discovered in many places throughout the scripture that is correlating and describing the same time period. What is the Thyatira time period? Remember? What's, what's, the, what's one of the most important time prophecies besides the 2300 year prophecy? Well, the 70 weeks is important. Um, the 1,260 is, yeah. And then, which is also the same as 42 months. It's also the same as time, times, and half a time. That's why we went through scripture to discover that not only in Daniel and Revelation, but in many other places, it's describing that time period. Okay? So, um, we went through that last last Sabbath. So um, in 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 uh, Lou, is that the right word? In in referring to the very beginning of these verses, and to like an angel of the church, and to the angel of the church of in Thyatira, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like the flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I'm going to start breaking this down here. Okay. All these words here from 18 to 29, hopefully, but there's some sidebar issues that also um, are included in this. And yeah. Brass, that, <laughs> <laughs> that means he's, that means his color is black. No, it's not. No. Is that a timeline of the, of the statue of the clay, the iron, the brass? No. No, 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 because in, in Revelation chapter one, verses nine, and also in verses 18, also in Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel chapter eight and nine, you will see connections in what this is describing. Now, um, the, uh, and, and here's some of that, here's some of that evidence, okay? So, these words that I just repeat or just spoke here in 18, okay, these are descriptions of Jesus that are fitting to the condition of the church in Thyatira. I kind of went over this last Sabbath. It says there, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like the flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Now, people will say, well, it's his feet are fine brass, therefore he's African American, he's black. So he's Rastafarian. I know, I know. I've had conversations with Rastafarians and African Americans. I don't know if that's the proper way of calling them. I don't know. Um, you know, my other fellow brothers that say, "Oh no, 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 no." He's that. That means he's black. And I go, "No." And so then they build a whole church around that. So let's find. <laughs> Let's 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 see what the word of God says. See, this is where you eliminate your feelings and you let the word of God express. OK, so um, the eyes of Jesus see and examine. Let's start with the eyes and flames of fire first. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of the word of God. That's in Hebrews chapter four, verses 12 and 13. I will go there right now. So you can picture this in your mind, what the word of God says, Hebrews chapter four, very important chapter. If you ever want to discuss with somebody about the Sabbath, uh, verses 12 and 13 says this, verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who we must give an account. Boy, that's, that's the gospel. Did you know that? How horrible. 
don't judge me. Don't tell me, you know, right? I mean, that's what I would get. The, that's what Paul would get these days. Don't judge me. I just want to hear about love, love, love. Just a smile. I just love. It's like, no. <laughs> we need to understand that there's a purpose in life. That's the gospel, is that there's enmity between Christ and Satan. And sometimes we need to examine ourselves. Sometimes someone might come as a counselor bidden by the Holy Spirit to say, I'm examining myself. You might want to examine yourself too. Because you don't want to be wrong when the day comes and say, oh, well, pff, it doesn't matter. You're going to like me whether you like it or not, Jesus. <laughs> it's not going to work. It doesn't work in court right now. It's not going to work in court in heaven. You want to be on the side of Jesus, and he knows all things. That means give it to him. Get rid of it. You understand? So nothing is hidden from the eyes of the word of God. The cries of his people do not go unnoticed. The references to eyes. Now, remember, this is about the church of Thyatira, 1,260-year period. Remember about the 1,260-year period. The cries of his people do not go unnoticed. That means that also those people that suffered from the hands of those who did rotten things to people who are walking in harmony with God are not unnoticed. There has to be a... A, a court in heaven to to rectify and re, reassess the judgments that man had made here on this earth against some of those that were birthed at the stake, tortured in prisons, taken from their families because they carried the word of God. You know, so the Lord also has to reassess and, and bring this back into the courts of heaven and say, wait a minute. OK, and we find that, that that pieces of evidence inside the word of God of that actually happening. Remember, there's three type, there's three stages of judgment. Remember, investigation and then the verdict and then the reward. That's the United States government. That's how you, they work in the courts. You know, if you if you're being accused of something, they just don't say guilty, death by incineration right i mean is that fair no there has to be what well we need to investigate to see all the the facts and then after, based on those facts we determine a, a verdict and then there's a reward for that verdict whether it's guilty or not guilty it's the same thing where do you think america picked that out or where do you think true judges pick up those those concepts it's here in the in the word of God. So people like Desmond Ford that says there's no such thing in the Bible as an investigative judgment. Oh, now there's a study that you should all go home and study out and see how many hundreds of scriptures describes an investigative judgment. One of them is here inside these verses inside chapter two of Revelation about the church of Thyatira. Okay. Anyways, so the reference to eyes as a flame of fire would be very familiar to a people who labored in foundries with their flaming furnaces where f now here you go uh kelly pay attention where fine brass and bronze were manufactured in all sorts of articles for the market now here's the thing remember that before um we discovered that there is um there that in the church of thyatira there was guilds there was labor unions in fact thyatira was the biggest city that had the most labor unions and if you were not part of a labor union you had a really hard time surviving okay and so there was secret guilds there was hierarchies to these guilds these guilds uh, produced and manufactured many cults. Oh, isn't this so familiar? To me? You don't understand why Ellen White was like, you need to be careful of labor unions. I, in modern times, it's going to get even worse. So this is a, a pamphlet that came to Elder Daniels in the church of uh, Fresno way back in the day in the, in the late 1800s. She writes this. Um, he who has eyes are as a flame, as a flame of fire is searching every church in the world. 
His gaze is piercing every heart. He is measuring the temple. Now, this is very important. And the worshipers thereof. Remember what Peter said about worshiping the temple and those who worship in the temple? Since if it starts with us first, what's it going to be like with those who do not worship in the temple? That's first or yeah, first Peter chapter four, I believe. Weighing all their actions in the golden scales of heaven and registering the results in the books of record. All things are open to the eye of him with whom we do have to, to with whom with whom we have to do. He is a discerner of the thoughts and intents and purposes of the heart. No deed of darkness can be screened from his view. Sin undetected by man, unsuspected by human minds is noted and registered by the, by the great heart searcher. So we're starting to get, uh, build a picture here of what it is. It's that these things says the son of God who has eyes like the flame of fire. He is making an account back in the Thyatira period of the church period of what was taking place to his people. Okay. But that's not only the only time he's done that. He does that continuously. He's investigating. He's observing. He's seen what every individual is doing in every church period. Okay. So now the feet like the feet of brass. Now this is where we might end up staying for the rest of the um, uh, sermon. Uh, Pete, can you pass these out? I don't, I got six. Okay, there might be enough, hopefully. One, the, Kelly and Kathy might have to share. Now, let's, let's look at the next one about the feet like fine brass, okay? And this is not in your notes, but that's why I printed this out, okay? The feet are referenced... To what? what? What would feet be referenced to? The gospel that Jesus died for. Okay. Those sandals that wrapped his feet walked him from village to village, releasing the bondage of so many. These feet paid the dear price in the fiery furnace of persecution. His feet. The textual evidence shows this brass is actually more likely of gold, having been burned, burnished, as and radiant. Okay? A fit description of the mighty angel who is writing to a persecuted people that will soon be living in darkness and suffer persecution by the hands of the serpent seed. So, Look at this in Ephesians chapter 6. I was just in Hebrews, so if you go back a couple of books, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Look what it says there. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Before Paul talks about feet, he talks about the complete items of the armor of God. Okay, and it's all in order. It's really amazing how he kept this all in order. Okay, so before the feet, listen to what he says in verses uh, 14. Stand, therefore. Remember where stand, man, that should come out like a, like a big beacon of light. Remember where we found stand before? Remember Exodus chapter 14? Stand therefore and let the Lord be your salvation. For you shall, right, for he shall fight your battles and you shall hold your peace. Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. He said, stand therefore, not in a, in a um, aggressive uh uh, uh, pose of uh, offense, but this is defense. 
you got no reason to be fighting. Stand there for having what? Girded your waist with truth. Having put on, that means you've already have put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now remind you, this is before the feet. This is before the feet, okay? Having shod your feet with the preparation, oh, of the gospel of peace. Oh, before the gospel of peace, you need to make sure you stand and let the Lord, oh man, I gotta go back to Exodus, man. Gotta go back to Exodus. These are one of the most powerful and I love these verses right here because it has so much power in it. Exodus chapter 14. Verses 13 and 14, when it's talking about stand, Exodus 14. This you should memorize. Memorize. Verses 13 and 14. When Paul's talking about standing, he's talking about this right here. Remember what Exodus is about? What's the Exodus story about? Leaving, um, uh, leaving bondage, right? The, and who's leading them? Jesus, Jesus is leading them. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and they're getting to that Red Sea, right? And that Red Sea is their baptism. That's what Paul calls it. Is That's when they're baptized. Now they're at the edge of that sea, and they look behind them, and there's an army of Egyptians coming at them. They don't know what to do. And they're freaking out. We're, we're dead. We're done. Well, what does Moses say? It says, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand. There's that word. Stand still. And what? See the salvation of your Lord. There's that word see. There's that word see, which he has accomplished for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. For the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now, I hope you kept your finger there in Ephesians. Okay. Because Ephesians chapter six, verses 15 says, having shod your feet. Man, were they walking? Were they walking? Yes. They were walking, having shod your feet with the preparation. That should really be really loud to you because you should be prepping with the truth and girding yourself with the truth. You should have already been putting on that breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. What's righteousness? Right doing. Right doing. That's what Ellen White calls it in, in, uh, uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 226, she says, righteousness is right doing. Makes a lot of sense. With the truth, first truth, then righteousness, because of that truth, which is the word of God. And then you walk, shot, shotted with those, with the, with the, uh, with the feet, preparation with the gospel of peace. Now, this is really important because I just showed you there. The Lord said, you shall hold your peace, right? What peace? Is that the peace and love that we find in hippie movements and uh, peace? Or, you know, the peace of the world is just looking for peace. Just a smile. <laughs> no, no. What peace? Well, when you go to Matthew chapter 5, it'll tell you. It'll help us understand a little more. Remember now, this is this is in concept with a certain entity in the church of Thyatira. A certain symbolism. There's a Jezebel there, right? Make sure you... Uh, no, you don't have to hold your finger there at Ephesians anymore. So if there's a Jezebel, there's what? What else is there? Ahab. And what else is there? Who are they after? Elias. Elias. Oh, okay. Elijah. Yes. Elijah, right? Remember, this whole concept here, preparation, 
is coming into the understanding that remember the Thyatira church period goes though the the Jezebel goes all the way through to the end until Jesus comes again okay that means that the kings will still be there not that they're going to live for that long but the the symbology and the characteristics of those kings will be there and the symbology and the characteristic of Elijah will be here until the end of time until Jesus comes again okay preparation so look what it says there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Oh, and the United Nation loves that one, right? Yes, they do. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, they're the peace treaties, right? And the, you, you, you know, the, the uh, NATO uh, armies that go in and they, they destroy a country and then they go and feed them rice. And right, you know, there's the peacemakers in their tanks. Holding their, gun, <laughs> holding their guns out to one enemy that they believe is an enemy. To, uh, that's peace, right? We're looking for peace, aren't we, in this world? Yes, the world is looking. For, is that what? Blessed are the peacemakers. What are the peacemakers? Have you ever thought about that? You ever done a study on looking what, a, what peace means by what God's standard of peace is? it would it would it's one yes you should okay so take this expand on it so this united nations idea is the one that you would find in ezekiel when they cry peace peace or peace and safety sudden destruction comes upon them right what is god talking about what is jesus talking about here when it comes to peace and being a peacemaker stand for the Lord will stand, for the Lord will fight your battles and you shall hold your peace. Okay, that this one in the United Nations, that's a Babylonian attempt to be like gods, believe it or not. So if we go to Isaiah though, look at what Isaiah says in verse 27. I hope you don't mind, we're gonna do a little back, back and forth here in the Bible. Isaiah, going to and fro. yes, like it says in Isaiah 25. Isaiah 27, look at what it says there in Isaiah 27, verses 2 through 5. I'm, I'm sorry, that's to and fro, it's Isaiah 28. Uh, verse 2 through 5, Isaiah 27. Verse 2. You ready? Here it goes. Isaiah 27, verse 2. In that day sing to her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, keep it. I water, I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and the thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together or let him make hold, uh, let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with the nations. Babylon. Who? Me. me who's the me that's what well, it's God what is being a peacemaker what is it about being a peacemaker it's not about having peace in this world Jesus says there is no peace in this world there's only peace through me you understand it's when you struggle, those who have fought with the Lord, struggled to find truth, and have finally, after so much exhausting journeys with the world, have finally surrendered their lives entirely to God of the Bible and set their hearts on him and made peace with him. Who have finally said, I am not here for this world. I am here to reach the kingdom of heaven because the Holy Spirit is, is impressing me to follow the Lord that I find in this word right here. Blessed are the peacemakers that make peace with their Lord and Savior. Theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Oh, amen. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. No. Well, yes, that's Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. 
But it goes further. Isaiah 64. Let's see what Isaiah says in Isaiah 64. Verses 6 through 8. And you know, you can't do this on your own. There isn't like trying to make peace with God by trying to work your way to heaven to make a checklist of things. Well, I've done this for him and I did that for him. I did this. It's not, it's not Santa Claus. You're not waiting for Christmas. You understand? For present. Right. You're not, you're not trying to work your way to heaven. Because look what it says here in Isaiah 64. But we are all, is everyone there? I hear pages turning. You got it? Okay. It says there, we are all like an unclean thing. And all our, un, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We, have, we all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name. Who stirs, uh, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are potter, and all we have, all we are, is the work of your hands. You can't do anything until you let the Lord shape, fold, and fashion you. And even then we dry out and we crack and he breaks us and he starts over again. And you know what that is? That's the process of making peace with God. That's sanctification. Yeah, that's sanctification. That's the work of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's to take hold of God is to call upon his his name and to be strong to make repairs by personal communion with him in order to heal the clay in the hands of the potter and that's what the, all that concept is is to let the lord take you and heal you now what does that do what does that do it's to establish oneself with god isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That's why it says, blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because you can't do anything yourself. You have to be empty of self so that the Lord can fill his spirit. Do you see why in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 is so important first because you have to have that what that belt of truth and that breast plate breastplate of righteousness so that you can allow the holy spirit to shod your feet with this gospel that says there's an enmity out there and that enmity is telling you and deceiving you and you're trying to find peace in the world. You're trying to find all sorts of ways to cover up all the distractions and all the delusions and all the craziness of your life. And it's making you more and more depressed. If you just surrender to God. So that's Matthew 5, 3. You see why I'm putting this out there? Do you think that the ones inside the, uh, the church of Thyatira period did not need to know this? How do you think that they managed to make it through? We're spoiled. We're, we're a spoiled generation. You know that, right? Yes. Man. I, like <laughs> I know. I like it. I know. <laughs> I know. But there's a consequence to it. The church does not grow when everyone's sitting on the couch. When does the church grow? When they're persecuted. It's the only time the church has ever grown. Isn't there like an absolute disarray in our Adventist church right now? 
Don't you think that the Lord is allowing that to happen? He said it would happen. What do we do? We stand on that ship and just keep going. Remember? We don't jump the ship. We know that this is the ship that we're on, that we're to stay on. And the Lord is going to allow it to go through a storm. Why? Why is he going to allow it to go through a storm? Okay, it's a shaking, but somebody might not understand what that means. They might put their own thought process into that. Where can I find evidence of how this has happened before? Okay, Noah's time. That was for the entire world. Yeah. The Dark Ages, okay. <laughs> oh, I love you, Carol Ann. Okay, so the first great disappointment. When was that? Ah, oh, no, 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 no. Oh. Mm, mm. Go bar farther back, way farther back. Centuries back. Oh, when Christ was crucified. Yeah, when Christ was crucified. Wasn't there a great disappointment? Why didn't he just tell his disciples? He did tell his disciples. Why didn't he just like, I mean, what was the deal with that? They, he, I was just reading this morning, and Christ, and it says in there in red letters, and Christ said to them, and you know, in, in three days, I'm going to be crucified. And he just kept walking. <laughs> it's like they didn't even, so we're going to win the Romans, right? It's like, why, why did he do that? You know, I mean, they, they, they had the uh, the uh, the feast day was coming in, and Jesus was riding on a donkey. You know, that's a symbol of kingship. You know, and they're saying, "Blessed Hosanna." Why did he let him do that? Why didn't he say, "Stop, stop, stop"? I'm not here for this kingdom. Why? Why did he? Why did he allow that to happen? Yes, that's true. That yes. Right. You'll know that this was taking place. Yes. So here's the thing. Is there wheats and there's tares? Is there is there how many people were there blessing him Hosanna as he was coming through the king of the king of king of, yeah how many were there when he was being crucified how many of the same people in 1844 there was I mean by its high point in 1843 boy and this is not an advent movement mind you this is all these churches that came together that were realizing because their eyes were being unsealed about things that were taking place inside the book of Daniel and Revelation that they could say, wow, this is happening uh, in living time right now. And they were like, blessed G, ah. how many were there when the great disappointment actually came? Hiram Edson, boy, read Hiram Edson's uh, account of this. It was 52 people were left. Is that a remnant? <laughs> was there a remnant during the time when Jesus was crucified? Yeah. Okay, I'm going side off the sidetrack here, but this is the point. What was the point? Why did why does God allow person suffering to happen? To see who is true and who isn't. Why did he pour out the manna? It says it in, in Exodus 14. He said, I'm giving you manna for what? To test my people. He didn't do it to feed them. He could have fed them. He could have brought animals from all over. The I mean, he could have just started growing plants and stuff, and they could have just been harvesting corn, I mean, or whatever. Why did he do To test my people, whether they would obey my law or not. That's why he does what he does. When it comes to why is there so much per why is he persecuting the Adventist movement right now? Yes, he is. Well, he's not, I'm sorry, he's not persecuting. He's allowing these things to unfold. Thank you, guys. Sorry. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't need to do that. We do it enough. I mean, to, the devil spins the top and walks away, and we do the rest. I mean, we don't even need the devil to drive ourselves into, yeah. So that's the that's the concept, though, because he's searching those and waiting for those who would obey him.
stay on the ship. Okay? Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Look what it's... Uh-huh, verses 1 and 2. Boy, yeah, this might be the only place we go this morning. Just a couple pages over. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. It says, that says... Oh, I'm sorry, your page is turning. Ready? Isaiah? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. I'll wait. Who wrote the book of Isaiah? <laughs> okay. Just checking. Making sure everyone's here this morning. <laughs> Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> All right. Who was Mark? Yeah, but who was he? Was he a disciple? No, he was a cousin of Barnabas, remember? Oh. Yeah, or the nephew. Some say nephew, some say cousin. Barnabas? Uh-huh. Let, let Barnabas go? Yeah. Yeah. John Mark is who wrote that book? Uh, no, no, no. Mark, Mark, John, John, Mark, Mark wrote the by... accounts of the yeah. one of the four Gospels. He was the nephew or the cousin of Barnabas. Oh, yeah. Wow. You read that in the book of Acts. Anyways, okay, Isaiah 66. Ready? It says there, uh, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and my earth my, is my, and the and earth my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one, I will look. On him who is poor and of contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Making peace with God is the one who has a broken spirit and a contrite heart to say, Lord, you do this. Stand and let the Lord be your salvation today. And he will fight your battles. And you will hold your peace. Therefore, now I don't think this is in your notes because I just kept on typing after this. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Like it says in Ephesians chapter 6. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus, having peace with God. Surrendering all your life to him. Do not try to work these things out by yourself or through the world. Now, what does that mean, though, walking in the footsteps of Jesus? Now, this is where it starts to get a little personal for everybody here. You know what Matthew 22 is? This starts to get a little personal because here means that you have to do something. <laughs> you know what Matthew 22 is, right? The whole main concept of Matthew 22 is the wedding. The wedding. Now listen to this, because once you start walking, what does that mean, though? Do you just walk to the couch and sit down and watch football and say, I made it. <laughs> I made peace with God. I'm good now. I'm okay. No. What, what's the gospel? The gospel is good news. Do you hide it under a bushel? No. Listen to what it says here. This is the parable of the wedding feast, okay? I'm going to read through it first. It says, and Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who ar arranged a marriage for his son. And here's the key word, sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent, there's that word, out other servants saying, tell those who are invited see i have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready come for the wedding but they made light of it and went their own ways uh, one to his own farm another to his business and the rest seized his servants treated them spitefully and killed them but then but when the king heard about it he was furious and he sent out his armies this and 
sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. What do you think? What, do you, what city do you think that is? City of God? No, 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 no. He didn't furious and burn the city of God. God wouldn't do that. You have to understand the parable. I'm going to tell you right now, that's the city of Jerusalem that was burnt in 70 AD. That's what I meant. Oh, oh, the city of, well, that's not the city. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. I get what you mean, though. Okay, yeah, that's the city of Jerusalem destroyed in 70 AD. So you kind of know where you are here. This is a timeline, okay? But there's personal aspects on every single bit of this. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready for those who are invited, uh, ready, but those who were invited are, were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So that is the, um, the Gentile. Yes. Okay, because why? Because the Jews rejected the Messiah, city destroyed. Therefore, if you read in Acts chapter 15, I believe it is, or Acts chapter 13, Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, are uh, being uh, uh, Barnabas, persecuted. That Barnabas is the cousin to Mark? Yeah. That Barnabas. Yes. But that's not, not Barabbas. Barabbas. You're thinking Barabbas. No, I'm saying Barnabas. Barnabas. Yeah, yeah. Not Barabbas, Barnabas. Yes. So they were being, um, they were being um, accused by Jews about preaching false gospels and they said uh, suffer it for you that you would not accept the messiah therefore we turn our gospel to the gentiles because you rejected the messiah so right there is the key that shows that it went from the jews to the gentiles because he's like okay so there's a whole concept behind that Therefore, go into the highways, and as many of you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both. Look at that, bad and good. Oh, wow. And the wedding, uh, wedding hall was filled with guests. But the king, but when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Isn't that Kind of like an investigation. Hmm. Wasn't he investigating something? Here's another piece of evidence that shows an investigative judgment. You see that? This is a timeline. It's ticking away here. Interesting. I can't get into all the details of that's coming later, but I'm just giving you an aspect here of something that has to do with Thyatira preparation, Elijah, and what our role is in this end time, okay? So he said to him, friend, how did you come into here, uh, come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He didn't say, because I followed you, or no, he was absolutely speechless. And then the king said to the servants, that's the angels, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Whew. Look at this now. The key word here is sent for us. We first put on that breast, that, that belt of truth. We, and there's many more. I'm just talking about the concept from the waist down. And we put on that belt of truth and that breastplate of righteousness. And then we start to go because we recall, but we can't just go barefoot. We put on that shods on our feet, the gospels. What does it mean to be called three times? To be called three times. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to look at that in a second here. I'll show you. Because being called is the same as being sent. Okay? Just put that in your mind. So... Here's the three. Here's the three right here. Who was the first one called in the in the New Testament? Who was the first one sent? No. Think earlier. What what was the purpose of Elijah? What was his purpose? To 
to remember what Ephesians six fifteen said? Prepare yourself. Prepare. What was Elijah's message? To prepare the way of the Lord. Who was the first? John, the first. Let's all go to John chapter one, verse six. John chapter one, verse six. Verse six. Remember what the key word there in Matthew chapter 22 was the what? That he sent. See, and this is really important because this has everything to do with us. And verse three, and sent out his servants and called those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Now, verse six of John chapter one, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Right? There's the first one. This is why you have three there. I think we did the study or a portion of the study before. Now, the number two, who was the, who was the second one called? Because uh, later on in verse, uh, verse four of Matthew 22, and again, he sent out others. So first he sends out John the Baptist. What happened to John the Baptist? Yeah, he was, he was beheaded. Did, did he like go sit on the couch and go, I don't want to be beheaded. <laughs> he said, no, no, he went all the way. He walked in the footsteps of Jesus. Yeah. Okay. So then after that, because there was some that were willing not to come, who was the next group? And again, he sent out other servants. So in verse 22 or chapter 22, verse four was sent out other servants. Who were those other servants? Well, let's look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Whoops, went the wrong way. Luke, Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. It says there, and after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two. For what reason? For what reason? Be Witnesses. Before It says it right here. Before his face to every city and place where he himself was about to go. Were these Elijah's? You better believe they were. Did Jesus sent them out? 70. Oh, well, I'm not part of the 70, so I don't have to worry about it, right? I don't I don't need to worry about it, right? Is that true? Do do I have to Is there something that I need to do? Yeah, you have to be We have to let our light shine wherever we are. Yes. And what does that mean to let our light shine? Yeah, remember that belt of truth and that breastplate? All these elements here in the armor of God are there to display something to people. The glory of God? Yeah, yeah. You are to be my witnesses that everybody knows I am, I am the one who saves. I am the Lord and there is no other. Isaiah 43. The purpose of God you can find uh, I mean, the purpose of life is in Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 11. But I didn't need to put that there because I'm bringing out the walking in the footsteps of Jesus as, as they did in the church of Thyatira, the remnant that did not do what they said to do as they taught were by Satan. Because remember, there was a remnant inside the church of Thyatira that did not learn the things of Satan as the people in Thyatira were teaching to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to teach them seduction of idolatry. But he did have a remnant to those who in the remnant of the church of Thyatira. Is the church of Thyatira though, the compromising church? No, that's the one before. That's the third church period of Constantine that prepared the Thyatira church. Because it started with the compromising 
in Constantine's time, and then it went full blown. So compromise was the was the pathway to drive people into a concept that I will be like God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, the Antichrist. In the time of Constantine, he had writers like Hippolytus and oh, what was another name, um, who were writing, saying there's an Antichrist that's coming right around the corner. Well, we're, we're witnessing the reasons why. And there's, according to Daniel, there's going to be an Antichrist that's coming. And, we're, and he's writing, saying we're living in that time right now. And, here, and he's already here. And now he's growing. So we should expect the, the kingdom of Rome to fall apart. That was amazing. It's like they knew this, the prophecies. <laughs> oh, man. So, but here's the thing. So in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, we can get a concept that he sent out the 70, not just John the Baptist, but also the 70. Now, if I go back to Matthew chapter 22, is that all? He just sent out... John the Baptist to prepare the way, and then he sent out the 70 to prepare before he was even going to go. Now, mind you, there is an, these are Elijahs. These are evidences of Elijah in the New Testament. John the Baptist, the 70. And what were they doing? Preparing the way before the coming of Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound familiar? Is Jesus coming again? So now, is there more evidence? Um, let's see, in verse, uh, verse 8. Uh, then he said to his servants, the wedding is almost ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into highways, as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants, so who are those servants? This is after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So who would those servants? Now we're getting into the Christian church era of the seven churches. This is recording all seven church periods here. Are we in a, are we in a church period? Yes. Yeah. Laodicea. So all preparing for what before jesus would come they are preparing the people for the wedding now we're not going to be there there's a whole study about we're not going to be there at the wedding we are there for the wedding feast all right so the concept here though is is that we're preparing people supposed to be supposed to be preparing people for this wedding so that we'll be there for the wedding feast. I don't care about, I, I'm not saying I don't care. You know, the wedding only happens for a short time. It's just a short thing, especially in the Jew, Jewish times in the Old Testament, in the, New, in the New Testament. It was just a short little thing. It was the reception that was huge. And all the people, see, and God's like, I'm, I'm asking you, and the only way I'm going to know is that you're wearing the garment I gave you. And the servants are the ones that are showing the people where to get the garments. Not just John the Baptist, not just the 70, all servants. So what was, so like I asked, is it just John the Baptist? There was also the 12 disciples. So there's your three, John the Baptist, the disciples, and then the 70 were all called and sent out to prepare the way for the for the Lord. So that's the New Testament Elijah story. Do you understand? Jesus calls all to hear his voice. So if we read then in Matthew, like we did, uh, in verse 22, verse four, it says, and again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, who are the other servants? Those are the 70. And then afterward or before that, the disciples were sent. Then the 70, so John the Baptist, then the disciples, then the 70. So then after this time period of the destruction of Jerusalem, who else was sent after them? Everybody else. Anybody who heard the voice of the Lord 
is sent out to be a servant to guide people into the wedding. Do you understand? That's why there's a parable about the, about the ten virgins. And they're doing it at night. There's five that are foolish and five that are wise. So was all the examples before, the, the ones that I just read to you, were they before or after Pentecost? Before Pentecost, this, the John the Baptist, the 12 and the 70. Is that before Pentecost or after? After, huh? Yeah, so were the 70, weren't they? Yeah. So was John, well, John the Baptist was sent out before Jesus Christ. So is that before or after Pentecost? That's before Pentecost. <laughs> Did these guys have it all together? <laughs> Did they? No. No, they didn't have it all together. We have no excuses. No excuses. I might not have it all together, but I can't sit there and say, well, I don't understand it all, so I'm not going to tell anybody. Mm -mm -mm -mm. We are servants. Even if we have a... Um, a few things that are not quite clearly understood. God is still allowing us to go out there and teach and preach regardless because you'll go home like I do a lot of times when I make mistakes. I go, mm, that's right. That's not, that's not the right verse. And I go back and I study it so that the next time or if I can find that person and tell them, hey, 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 wait, listen, I'm not going to allow that to stop me. What's the most important thing? Uh, part of life. What's the purpose of life? Not me, not my glory, not my ego. Yeah, the glory of the Lord. No excuses. They still obeyed the commandment of Jesus, which is go. They didn't wait until they felt that they knew enough. If you read on in these testimonies, Jesus comforts them and uh, to rely, not to rely upon anything. He says, don't worry about the the, um, the sacks that you have, don't worry about your lunches, don't worry about the staff, don't worry about what people say to you. If they disagree with you, and he says first to go to who? Go to the lost children of Israel first. So who's Israel today? It's not all the churches out there, all the denominations. Yes. It's us. So Jesus is like trying to prep you to get you to be prepared so that you can teach others how to put on that armor of God and have peace with God. Blessed are the peacemakers. See? Do you understand? Yeah. So they didn't wait. And if you read on through these testimonies, Jesus comforts him and says, hey, I know. You don't have it all together right now, but I will do it for you. I will do it. Uh, did these who obeyed Jesus prepare the people after Pentecost? Yes. There was people later after Pentecost. How many were bad? Thousands were baptized. <clears throat> so even though there was some that didn't understand it all, did they later understand? Yeah, they did. So is that a concept of growing in Christ, being sharpened to the point to where now there's thousands that were baptized? For what? What were they baptized for? So that they all could go back to their couches and think about how interesting the message was today? <laughs> you understand the concept of Jesus gathering his people to get them ready for the wedding. And the thing is, there's many that just didn't care, don't care, go back to their farms, go back to their businesses. Hey God, it's not for me, man. Are we disappointed? Sure. But did that stop us from going and finding someone who will listen? It was Philip, you know, and he's like, how, do you, how can anything good come from Nazareth? And he's, what did, what did the, uh, the disciples say? Come and see. Was he still a doubting Thomas? Yeah, for a long, until when? Till after Pentecost. Till, oh, I'm sorry, until he saw Jesus. 
with his holes in his, and then he's like, wow, and fell on his knees. Hmm? So what does that mean though? Well, in the concept of this in reading Revelation chapter 16, one of my other favorite verses for preparation. Remember, this is all about preparation. Because Jesus says this, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment. You know that garment? You know what that garment is? What is that garment? Well, that's that wedding garment. Now, here's the thing. The, the wedding would take place over at the bride's father's house. Okay? And he would have to give the father a dowry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're not waiting. You're not you're not watching for the second coming of Jesus. You're watching and getting ready for what? The close of probation. Cuz the close of probation that's it. Doors are closed. Then Jesus comes. Doors of probation close, seven plagues. What's that last plague? Jesus. It's Jesus. Right? So. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. It's a plague to those who, yeah, are hide and fall on us, all the rocks, please, and hide us in caves. Because why? Yeah, man, and we don't want to be in that in that position. Man, I'll tell you right now. I don't. I I just seriously doubt how Jesus can make me one of the hundred and forty four thousand. I, I just can't see it. So I go, then Lord, kill me before that happens. But if if you kill me, please let me be able to cry your name out and say, I know who you were. Yeah. So now Revelation 16, 15 says what? Now, now in Matthew 22, verse 5, I threw that in there for a reason. So remember what that said. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment. Lest he, look at that, what it says in verse 15, lest he walks. Now I, it's in Revelation 16, 15. That uh, lest he walk naked and they say that walking, you know, it's not just naked, but that without the gospel on your feet, the peacemaker. Remember what pe the peace, this should change your mind about what it means to be blessed are the peacemakers. It means to have a, a surrender yourself. Yeah, making peace with God. Just look at it, the word backwards making peace with God. And that is that I am an unclean thing and you need to fix me. So, uh, Revelation, I mean, uh, Matthew 22, verse five, what did it say? But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. This is where a lot of Adventists are today. They went their own way, doing their own business, and saying, I, I can't, I can't teach the Bible. I don't know the Bible that well. I'm too afraid of what people are gonna say to me. The moment that you realize that it's God that directs us and commands us, then you go, I'll do it anyways. I'll do it anyways. Not that I don't, I'm going to be indifferent and aggressive towards people, but I, I'm not there to teach them necessarily. I'm there because God said go to teach me. He's trying to teach me. And I'm not trying to offend anybody, not you. I'm learning. If you you know, I tell this to people all the time. I don't know what you're getting out of my Bible studies or his Bible studies that I'm presenting to you, but I'm getting something out of it. Maybe you're not, but I am. I mean, if that's what it takes, one person, just one person. And here's the question. Oh, man, 
And this is really hard. This is a hard one to swallow. Your ticket to heaven relies on the person that you guided to Christ. When's the last time you guided somebody to Christ? Oof. You know that, right? Every week you should ask yourself and then pray to the Lord. Lord, find somebody for me. In desperation. I don't care who it is. Grab the person off the bush. He's got twigs in his hair and a can of 40 ounce hanging out of his pocket and get him to church. I'm talking to myself. Get him to Jesus. Yes. Church. But the thing is, when you bring them to church, they're in an environment that is the sanctuary in the house of the Lord. And they're, they're in a like-minded place. Yes, you're right. There's uh, avenues that need to guide, continue walking with that person to help them grow and not forget them and throw them by the wayside. They're not numbers. That's a tough one. But I've known this in my own experience. There's Laura. How'd she get here? Somebody told her. How'd I get here? You know how I got here? Turn around. Go look behind you right now. Do it. Look behind you. There it is. <laughs> that person right there. Got you here? Yeah. Oh. Praise God. Yeah. How did you get here? My mom and dad. Okay. Now expand on that. <laughs> Why are you still here? <laughs> because because my heart. you understand? Does it make sense? <sighs> this isn't not every time everyone hears this in church. But you should ask the Lord every week, Lord, find me somebody. And they're going to turn you down. They're going to laugh at you. Don't, I don't care. I'm not concerned about what they think. I want to know what he thinks. Hmm? It's a hard one because the scariest part of our lives is being intimidated and being ridiculed or, you know, knocked down to where, I mean, there's, there's almost at least once a week, I'm intimidated, humiliated, and felt like an idiot as I'm trying to reach to somebody to pry out the world and to put back in there saying, Holy Spirit, do this, put that in him, please. And I walk away, I go, man, I'm such an idiot. But I don't, I don't want to stop. I'm not trying to earn anything. It's I'm desperate. I want to see them in heaven. I'm not puffing myself up here. I'm just the only an experience I can think of is my own, my own testimony here and the word of God. Did those 70, did they, did they walk away and go, oh, no. They obeyed the disciples. They didn't know anything. They, they kept asking him, so were we going to sit on your right side or on your left side? He's like, you don't even know what you want, man. You know, his, their mother is like, come on, put them on your left and your right. <laughs> oh, they'll be on my left and my right, all right. And they did. John, last one to die. Who was his brother? James. James, first one to die. Yeah, Aww. two bookmarks. Aww. Yeah, James was kicked out of a or pushed out of a, a second story building. And word says that, or not the word, but tradition says he came down on his knees praying the whole time. Aww. And they killed him. They stoned him. Mm -hmm. The first, no, first martyr, yeah. Mm -hmm. The first disciple that was was martyred was James. You understand? Mm -hmm. To their death, man. 
I'm not saying you need to go and find out a way to die from it. Yes, yes. Spiritually die. Yeah, to ourselves. It's right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And and you know, that's why Exodus 14, verse 13 and 14, is so powerful. Yeah. Stand. Yeah. You take that right back to Ephesians. What does that mean, stand? Putting that armor of God on so that you... We'll let the Lord fight your battles and know the salvation of your Lord is today. Now go tell somebody. You cannot make it to heaven on your own. Your ticket is that you can, they're going to say, where's your ticket? <laughs> you know, right here. See that guy right here? See? You want to be able to say, I brought somebody to the Lord. Seriously. And it gets easier and easier the more you do it. And you get bolder and you get bolder. Not aggressive, not haughty and proud. I'm talking you get bolder and bolder because what happens is you go, man, I'm an idiot. And then, I, well, for me, I go back and I study it again. I go, okay, refine my brain, you glue head. What is wrong with you? You know, and then I refine it. And refine it. I go back and I listen to my old sermons from, oh, from 2008 or, you know, somewhere in that time. Oh, I'm like, ooh, I threw them out. I'm like, I can't even. Uh, those are horrible. What was I saying? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Okay. So, yes. With that said, how many here feel an urge to want to share the gospel? Then go study the word so you can. Don't be afraid. And with that said, oh, we're going to sing a hymn. That was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, oh, I am not a hymnal person, so please forgive me. We're going to sing. Praise you. <laughs> well, I was going to sing because what I know okay. is 652, and I want you all yeah. to know this. Yeah. Hymn number 652, yeah. Love at Home. And I'll guide you through this because this isn't one we hear all the time. But as a Mormon, which is really weird, I grew up on this this hymn. Yeah, yeah it's really weird. I couldn't believe the Adventist. Heaven. I don't know the tune. I know, but I'll help you through it. Okay? okay? <laughs> so... There is beauty all around when there's love at home. There is joy in every sound when there's love at home. Peace and plenty here abide, smiling fair on every side. Time doth softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home love at home love at home time to softly sweetly glide when there's love at home kindly heavenly smiles above when there's love at home all the earth is filled with love when there's love at home sweeter sings the brooklet by brighter beams the azure skies oh there's one who smiles on high when there's love at home love at home love at home time to softly sweetly glide when there's love at home jesus makes me holy thine when there's
there's love at home. May thy sacrifice be mine. When there's love at home, safely from all harm, all rest with no sinful care, distress. Though thy tender mercy bless, when there's love at home, love at home, love at home, time to softly, sweetly glide, when there's love. Isn't it right? Isn't it true? Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Um, this house is your home. Our hearts is, is your home. And Lord, we want it to be continuous in our lives. So Lord, as you guide us and lead us into this period of Elijah, the end time Elijah, Lord, I ask that you guide us through the feet of the gospel of peace. And Lord, that you guide us so that we'll tell others and bless each one that's here. Bless this Sabbath day. Bless those who are listening and who are watching and will see this on YouTube. And Lord, I just pray that each one will have a special blessing, that they'll have the desire to teach the truth that is in your word and be able to have the breastplate of righteousness so that we will all be able to guide more people into your arms and be prepared for the wedding. And I say this all in your precious son's name. Bless each one that's here in your holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen.